Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Baptist Church Bible Study. We're back in the book of Mark, chapter number 10. And this is the first day of October, 2023. Isn't that cool? Yeah, there's 30 more days and it's Halloween. Woo-hoo! Amen. Hey, that's a good stuff. We're going to have a good time. A five-week month, and so we have a singing on the last Sunday night, and you guys need to get ready. If you've never sang in church before, this is your night to sing, play, do whatever God has you given you. The desire, I was going to say talent for, but you really don't even have to have great talent, but we'll listen to you. And we rate you with our signs, six, three, okay? And all right. But this morning, we want to look back at a couple of places we left off. At, I introduced you last week to the rich young ruler. He's called that because we made his name up. We evidently, he was rich. We're thinking that he was young. And because of that, he wrote, he had much good. So we assume that he was a ruler. Does that make sense? Nowhere is he called a rich young ruler. He's called those names that cross away, but we, we, may, we got to name him something, right? So that's what we're going to do. And when he was gone forth on the way, he came one, to one kneeling and uh, running and kneeled to him and asking, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Remember where he's at? All right. He's coming down the west side, I mean, excuse me, the east side of the Jordan River. He's getting ready to cross over exactly the same place that Israel went into the promised land in the beginning when God brought him out of the wilderness. He's going to head straight up to Jericho. Jericho was rebuilt uh, in the Old Testament. Joshua, when he destroyed it, he said, uh, whoever rebuilds Jericho, he'll do the gates with, with his older son and the found, that foundation with the older son will die in that and the gates will die in his youngest son. And if you read through, when they did rebuild it, God gives you the record that that happened. But they didn't rebuild the Jericho then with the Jericho that Joshua destroyed. So there was two of them. In the Lord's day, because a lot of pagan Gentiles had moved into the area, the Jews had their own city of Jericho. And today when you go, there's like you can find the three they're close together, but there's three cities of Jericho, the old ruins and the old one that, and the Gentile one, okay, that goes through it. The road went through or right around all of them up the Jericho Road. And if you've never done that, I'll show you pictures someday. And if you think it would be fun, you just need to go to Maui and drive the road to Hana, okay? So that'll, be, that'll get you out of the mood. There's a few things to say on the way. Most of it is extremely... Uh, the, the countryside drops off probably from Jerusalem to there. I keep trying to remember. I, it's not, almost 2,500 feet to where the Dead Sea is in just about, what, Michael, 40 miles, something like that? 30 miles, something like that, maybe 25 miles. So if you're walking the Jericho Road, and today it is a paved highway that we would have in some little tiny county in East Texas where nobody hardly drives. That's about how big it is, okay? And so lots of wonderful sights to see like cliffs and mountains and crags and all the things and the ingenuity of human, humans building gate to three drills and high cities in, in the walls of mountain caverns. Just amazing thing to do. But it was a dangerous place. Uh, on the Jericho Road was members where the man was attacked and beaten. And there were only very few places to stay from the top to the bottom. And the Lord's getting ready to go through Jericho, okay? And he crosses over. Before he does, he runs into this young ruler that comes out to meet him, and he's asking him a question. Remember I told you there last week we talked about all the people that I'd, all out of Jerusalem, all those that hated him especially, and all those who are trying to get some kind of approval, and those who are waiting for food and everything else were already over there following him in crowds. And he asked him a question. When he had gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now listen to me one more time. He called him master, which is the other word for rabbi or teacher. If you have a, for, for years and years and years, you couldn't teach, be a lead teacher in a school in America unless you had a master's degree. Right now, we're desperate. If you've been to kindergarten, you're in. All right? 
Can you read and write? Especially if you can do cursive. We got you. He calls him good teacher. Now, a good teacher is way different than Lord. And all the time that Judas followed Jesus, he never called him anything but master or rabbi. He never called him Lord. Ever. Because he never was to him. Jesus stops his interpretation of who he is. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. What he just said, if I'm not more than a teacher, then I'm not good. Only God is good. Either I'm God or I'm not good. For there's none good. That's what he just told him. When you don't think that your preacher or any evangelist or somebody else is teaching what God says, you will never do it. I don't care how good they are. I don't care how good they are. Samuel said, which one of you can accuse me of anything? Have I ever stolen anybody's stuff? Stand up here. Have I ever taken anything? Have I ever done anything wrong? Have I ever done all that stuff? Can anybody accuse me of anything? Nobody could. All right? But that didn't mean he was good. He still had sins because he had a lot of trouble with his family and wouldn't do anything about it. Should have thrown him out of the deal. I would have thrown him out. You say, well, your own kids? Absolutely. They have them being my kids and having the right to live like the devil and act like they're part of God's workers. I have two different things. I don't care who you are. Do I love them? Yeah. Do I like them? Yeah. Well, sometimes I like them. Okay. But I love them. Yeah. And all. Would they like me for that? No. And so what Samuel did in that situation is he chose his children over God. You understand that? But preacher, they're my kids. See, this is a tough thing. Let's go back to a verse Jesus said, something like, this. he that loveth... Quote it to me, somebody. Sister, brother, husband, or wife, or children more than me is not worthy of me. It's a tough world as a Christian. Paul said it would be easier if he didn't have a wife or a husband, and especially if he didn't have kids, especially if you can't tell them no. It's a tough world. Jesus said, there, there's none good but me. Thou knowest the commandments. So now he's going to get to him another day. Wait. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not, don't defraud, not honor your father and mother. Now, when I witness to people about Jesus, you know what I say? They say, well, I, I don't think I've ever sinned. I said, have you ever lied? You ever stolen? You ever disobeyed your parents? You're... Okay, I'll just go through the Ten Commandments. By the way, he got us on all ten, guys. Okay, so there's we're all ten, we've all broken all ten of them. If that wasn't enough, my Bible says God knows your thoughts. You ever thought anything wicked? You're going you're gonna to be judged for your thoughts when you're lost. Do you know that? I'm glad I'm saved. I'm covered. Anyway, you're thinking what about me all those years? What? Yeah. All right. And he answered him and he lies. Master, all these things have I deserved from my youth. Now, the Lord did something particular. He left out one. I actually left out a couple. Can you name the couple he left out? Number one went one. All right, number one. And the Sabbath is not in there, okay? Uh, number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you put anything in front of God, who is your God? 
He doesn't say, you sorry liar. I know everything you've ever done. I can tell you the time you did this and then. He doesn't. He just goes, have you kept them all? I've done, uh, yeah, I've done all those. Jesus said a man that looks on a woman to lust after has committed adultery with her in his heart. Whew, the New Testament's even worse than the old. We, you think it and you're required of it. And he said, Master, all these things have I observed from my youth. And also, he, you're not supposed to lie. There's the other one. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. So you're thinking, Jesus got to hate this sinner, right? And that's a hard thing. I'm, I'm going to go back to my kids because they make a good use of this. Do you think I love my kids? Well, if you loved them, you'd have to agree with them. <coughs> really? Maybe it would mean I don't love them enough to disagree with them. Jesus loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. And what he's going to tell him to do is put God first in his life. You can sell all your stuff and give it to the poor and you won't be going to heaven. That's not what he's telling you to do. One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, thou shalt have treasure in heaven, come take up your cross and follow me. You notice it had two things there. Three things actually. Sell your stuff, give it to the poor, come and find me as your treasure. And the Bible says, and he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Now, if you go back to that, we're talking Matthew, same thing, comes to him, same thing, almost exactly word for word. He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Luke, he went away because it says a certain ruler, here's how he got it, a rich, young in the mark, Ruler in Luke, and down at the last word, he was rich. So we got the rich young ruler. We put it all together and made up a name for him. Okay, cool. He asks him the same questions, tells him the same things, quotes the same things. He, he tells the same lie because this is, they're all talking about the same example. I, I talk to people about the Lord, and I say, well, you know, the Lord died for our sins. And I actually have people say, I've never sinned. Well, that makes you a liar. But anyhow, for all of sin, then come short of the glory of God. Now, watch this. There's only one God, and money or anything else can give what they really can't give God what they should say can't give men what they really need salvation. You, you can't work enough. If I can, if I'll be happy if I had enough money, that's why movie stars and professional ball players are so happy. That's why politicians, once they get billions of dollars, are extremely satisfied. Did you ever read that deal a couple months ago? They put out that, that Putin is worth like 37 or 38 billion dollars. Now, there's a happy guy. When, when did money or fame ever make anybody happy? I want to know the answer to that. Eventually, all that comes back around, and it's a burden too big. When the, when they get to be stars, and everybody knows their name, that's what they wanted, right? And everybody wanted to be around them, that's what they wanted, right? And everybody wants to watch and see what they do, because that's what they wanted, right? Then they get angry because the pap paparazzi comes around and takes pictures of them and crowds get around to see them and they hide and make up who they are so they can get out in public and act normal and get angry at people that ask for autographs. And Isn't that? Come on now, y'all act like I've been, gosh, a preacher, I grew up in a barrel. I ain't maintained none of that stuff. You've never seen any of those people that are... When you look at their lives, you ought, to, you ought to get sometimes on the channel, that, on the history channel or something, when they do in-depth stories of people's lives and they run histories of people and 
their personalities and things. And, and show me how they ended up. It's not how you run in your life, how do you end up your life? But to us, there's but one God, the Father of all, whom are of all things, we in Him, one Lord Jesus Christ, for whom are all things, and we by Him. It's God. You, put, you need God in your life. I never made so much money in all my life as I did when I was lost, guys. If you can't make money in the world, then I ain't going to say you're dumb, but I'm going to say you don't work in it. Especially if you use the world's tactics. My goodness. As a Christian, you get a little bit more restricted, and you're supposed to be where the world wants, where the Lord wants you and what He wants you to do. But I want you to understand, I never made so little in all my life till I became a pastor either. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the whole world. Nothing. I wouldn't do it. You say, I oh, not me, buddy. I'm going to do this. You know what? 80% of the young people who make commitments to be missionaries and pastors and teachers in Christian schools when they're teens don't do it. Because the world gets in their way. I have to do this or I have to do that. There's a lot of restrictions. As a saved man, I found out real quick that God had required me to marry a saved woman. Now, I'm going to be up front with you. I don't hardly know anything about women that I haven't learned from just being a pastor and being a brother to seven sisters and being married to one woman for almost 50 years. Okay? I know nothing, hardly at all. I do know this, that when I was praying about having the woman in my lifetime that I wanted, I didn't have a clue she was going to be from Indiana and would be so different. I figured she'd be a big, good old Southern girl and she'd talk with a drawl and we'd, you know. But I told the Lord, I said, you know, I, I'm, and through high school and college, I might have had as many as six dates, maybe probably closer to five. I probably lied about the number. All right. Nothing like what you're thinking about on a date. None of that. All right. But you know what I told the Lord? I said, I'm going to, whenever I meet anybody that I or think of potential, I'm going to do everything I can to show them that I'm a Christian. If that bothers them, I don't want them. I'm going to witness to people while she's with me. We're going to go to a restaurant and I'm going to pray out loud. If it bothers her, I don't want that one. I'm going to do goofy stuff like give away everything I make all week for the cause of Christ. And if that irritates her, it won't be the one that I want. I want a Christian woman. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Isn't that what the Scripture said? That's pretty plain, right? All right? I can't understand why we're having so many divorces with Christians. Maybe it's because they're marrying the wrong person. But I love them. For there's one God, one mediator of being God of men and the man Christ Jesus. Now, there we go. There's only one God and money and nothing else can take its place. Seeing is one God which will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. We all get to Jesus the same way, by believing. You know what? You know I can tell if you believe? When it changes you. You say, well, I have faith, but it didn't do anything to my life. You're not telling the truth. Faith changes who you are. Your faith in God will change you. You're not the same person that... If you were, then you didn't get saved. And then being Christ, he's what? New creature. Old things passed away. One God, Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. We all have the same likeness if we know the Lord, that we have the Holy Spirit on the inside. We ought to always be trying to encourage each other, strengthen each other, pray for each other, care about each other, take care of each other all the time. Not because they're brothers and sisters and this and that and the other. That's a responsibility of the world God gave you, whether you're saved or not. But I'm talking about in Christ, that we ought to be like that. There's a strange thing. Where shall the, whereby shall the world know that you're my disciples? 
How in the world will the world know you're my disciples? I'm preaching this this morning. Stick with me. When you love one another. He didn't say when I could quote Bible books or when I gave every dime I ever had or when I visited through the night putting tracks on the doors in the dark without a flashlight. Or when I went to any... He said, when you love one another, then will the world know that I, God has sent... And he didn't say me. He said him. God will know... The, the world will know that God has sent me. Talking about himself. I'm irrelevant. Isn't that weird? Because we love each other. We love Christian things. I don't... How many of you guys got Christian people in your lifetime you just disagree with? I doctrinally, I do. There are a lot of things I disagree with people doctrinally. But I care about them. All right? And believe it or not, in one of those things, sometimes I get under conviction about stuff. And that is checking on my pastor brethren. I kind of got my hands full. But I've been trying lately to do better and call them every once in a while and I called a guy this last week and said, hey, man, how are you doing? He goes, George, is this you? Yeah. He said, I hadn't heard from anybody in over a year. He's one of those retired guys. Where's all those ex-church members of his? I'm planning on running far away so y'all can't find me or nothing myself, but I expect you to call me. Check on what, I don't know what I want to do. You understand that? But I'm telling you this. We're supposed to care. There are believers, there's one God. Thou doest well. You say, well, I believe there's a God. The devils also, and, and they tremble, but they don't get saved because they believe there's a God. Except you believe, you would never repent. If you do believe, then you will trust. And when you trust, you'll receive. You ever tried to give somebody something and they're scared for you to give it to them? You know what I mean? You ever me telling you the story about trying to give away Gaither tickets? Nobody would take them. $30 Gaither tickets. Nobody would take them because they would look at me and go, something's wrong with this picture. They wouldn't believe. No, no, these are free. I don't. They're good tickets. They're right down in the front. You know, talk to Bill. He said, you could sit there. They're, that's a lie. I don't know Bill well, personally, but the only Bill I know is my brother <clears throat> and our song leader, right? But I'm serious. I couldn't give them away. I ended up throwing them in the trash because they called the cops on me for trying to give away Gaither tickets. I tried to give them to the cop. He was scared to take them too. No, sorry. So I said, okay, then I just, I just threw, I think I had three or four tickets, threw them in the trash. Yeah. So you you can say, well, I'm, you know, I know, I believe those are tickets, but I'm not, I'm not taking them. But if you have faith in God, you believe this who he is, then you receive the as many as received him. It's the gift. You, but you got to take it. You just can't believe that he is, all right? Nobody comes to God unless he believes who he is, and we'll talk about that later. And he warns about the danger of riches. Now, this is a terrible thing to tell a Jew, that riches are dangerous stuff. And you'll be surprised how many Jewish Gentiles there are in the world. Money becomes a big issue over almost everything else. Jesus looked around about and said to his disciples, now he just walked away. Over money, this guy just lost his soul. All right? And he says this thing, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Now look at the next verse. And the disciples were astonished at his words. They were Jewish enough. They were believing if I follow God into the kingdom, I'm going to be well to do and have money and yeah that's what they believed okay all right and and i explain this to you i'm a little bit out of time but i explain it to you like this they had this big problem when they were in the land they worshiped other gods and they when god threw them out of the land for it he made them prosper and they, they realized that was a dumb thing. And almost when Israel came back, they almost never again worshipped fake gods and false gods and any of those other things. But they learned something among the Gentiles. And that was how to make money.
And you could take Christian strategies and make them profitable in the world. One of the most famous retailers in all of American history was not a saved man. He wasn't Christian, but he tithed on everything he got. Everything he ever got. But he wasn't saved. Died a multi-billionaire. See, tithing works whether you're saved or not. Being friendly works whether you're saved or not. Caring about people works whether you're saved or not. Can I just go through all that? Being faithful to your wife works whether you're saved or not. Teaching your children right works whether you're saved or not. And you can take those principles that Christian people do and put them to practice in your life. That's what my father did. And he was still lost. He was the best guy in the whole world. But he didn't get saved till after I did. This guy's a good guy. He said it's hard for a rich person to go through than to heaven. It's hard for trusting they that trust in riches. Now, once there's the key word, not they that have riches. They that trust in riches. Because see, riches work in this world. They work well. You don't believe so. Work real hard, get enough money, and you'll figure that it works well in the world. It's hard for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God because you have to count all that stuff less worth. What happened when you get over in the New Testament? You got this guy sitting in a tree. He's a cheat, liar, thief, and betrays his people and he gets saved and he does what? Half of my goods I've given to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody, I paid them back four times. When I, when Jesus said, this day of salvation come to this house. See, because he quit trusting his money and trusted in God. They were astonished out of measure, saying, then who can be saved? Gosh, I thought being rich was being saved. I thought being powerful was being saved. And these are the disciples, guys. Listen to me. Don't tell me that. I've told you 15 times the story after World War II when Japan surrendered. We, they believed our God destroyed their God. And when we asked for missionaries, we sent sales and business people and we found out they found out what America's God is. It's money. MacArthur asked for 300 missionary families. He's got three. All three of them were previous soldiers who went back. Got three, but 3,000 businesses sent representatives over there. They learned who our God was. So they adopted our God and they still worship our God. Who can be saved? Well, see, the reality of that is... If you trust in your riches, then you're not saved and never can be. God, and I don't, I don't know about you guys, but God never told me that I had to do anything or give up riches or any of that stuff. But I found out something. I know it sounds stupid to almost everybody but me. That was the other fourth requirements, all the stupid thing that the world thought my wife had to put up with. Okay, I quit the best job in the whole world. I am not kidding. I finished up my engineer's degree and never wanted to use it. All I wanted to do is serve God. I went to work the first church and worked three months and they never paid me a penny and I didn't care. I wasn't married, didn't have kids to pay about rent, but I want you to understand it's not possible. I didn't starve, by the way, you can tell that. God, Jesus said, with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I'm telling you, we have a tendency, he's covered two or three things already. Things that you can put in front of God in the world and stay lost. And guess what? Christians can put them in front of the world, in front of God, and stay out of his fellowship. 
And nobody will hardly know it except for you. Isn't it neat? No, it's hard, ain't it? No wonder people don't want to be Christians. It's hard to be a Christian. I want to be a Swifty. I want to worship that one. Not me, buddy. Yeah. You got to get on the deal here, okay? I like, so you're, you're, and then and all my teens know what that is. It's almost nigh unto worship. Okay, when you can sell 25 or 30,000 more tickets to a ball game because you know she's going to show up there, that's a, that's a worship. I don't, I don't even know what she sings. I really don't care. But I want you to get this. Wouldn't it be cool if you could do that? Say, so you know what? The Lord's going to be here today and have thousands and thousands and thousands of young people show up there and be willing to pay a hundred bucks for a ticket just to get a chance to see him. hundred bucks, by the way, is a cheap ticket. It's amazing. You say, well, I, I want to be like her. She wore a jersey a couple weeks ago. The next week they sold 275,000 of those jerseys. Simply because she wore it. Tell me, who's God? I'm not picking on you. I like Johnny Cash's singing. He's dead though. I don't want to be where he's at. I think he's in heaven, by the way. Anyhow. But I still don't want to go there right yet. I'm not talking about music. I'm talking about the worship. Uh, is it, is it, would we work that hard for the Lord? So, listen to me. You say, well, I don't like that. No, don't tell me, just tell God. See, because I'm going to answer to Him if I tell you or not. And you're going to answer to God whether you do it or not. Now, I don't know anything about their singing. I'm not much into the new style singing stuff. I'm stuck back there. But I will tell you this. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of who you're worshiping. What you're worshiping. You can trade off a wooden stick idol for uh, money, but it still don't keep it from being an idol. I'm a I'm preacher. I'm worshiping popularity, whatever it takes. I'm telling you, there's a danger in riches, and Jesus said so. Lots, I figure that's a reason that God don't trust a whole bunch of us with a whole lot of riches. We're not poor, but we're nowhere near the top. Because it changes people. Doesn't it? Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for what you do with us. And thank you, Lord, that you understand our needs, not just salvation, not just food, not just. But Lord, we have a desire in our life to be liked. We, like, we have a desire in our life to be a part of something bigger than us. And Lord, we find all kinds of ways to fulfill that. And Lord, I'm asking you right now to touch our hearts. Remind us whose we are, what our responsibilities are, whether we're 15 or 75 or 80. Same responsibilities to the Lord. We ask you, Lord, your blessings as you bless things you do in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.